Wilmington, Delaware. I'm on the Amtrak, the last train out of Washington, D.C., back to New York City. It was impeachment day in Washington, D.C., and at midnight last night, I thought, geez, I'm in New York. I think that's near Washington. Why don't we just head down to D.C.? I got up in the morning, went down to the Amtrak station at Penn Station, got on the train. Let's go see if we can get into the, into the Capitol building so we can watch the impeachment of Donald Trump live and in person. That was our, that was our goal this morning. We had no idea if we could get in there. We just hopped the train. This is Michael Moore. And Philadelphia is next. <laughs> this is my podcast, episode number three, Rumble with Michael Moore. And I'm sitting on this train kind of reflecting on the day that, that we had. Uh, my sister Veronica is with me, my friend and producer, Basil Hamden, the three of us heading back to New York after a very long day. Well, we got in to the House of Representatives, into the actual chamber, the House of our U.S. Congress. We made our, our way to the gallery, which is essentially the balcony that, that uh, goes all around the, uh, the floor, above the floor of the House. And there we sat for hours listening to Democrats and Republicans uh, debate whether or not uh, Trump should be impeached. They set the, the time limit of the debate at six hours so that Republicans would get three hours and Democrats would get three hours. Okay, I know right there you're thinking, oh, Mike, please, don't play all six hours for me right now. I beg you. It's been a long day. Don't worry. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you my replay of what this day was like. Um, the first thing we did when we got to D.C. was to go over to the House Office Building, the Cannon House Office Building, uh, to look for the congressman from Flint, Michigan, um, which, of course, as you probably know, uh, is where uh, I was born and, and grew up. And um, we thought maybe the congressman from Flint could help us. I've known him since he was 17, and I was, I don't know, maybe 20 years old. And he was in. He was there. And we, uh, he said, sure, I'll walk you over. I'll get you in. That was, that was really what we thought would be the hardest part. How do we sneak in to the House while they're debating and voting on impeaching Trump? And we don't have any tickets. We don't have any passes. I don't have a press pass. I don't have it. anything other than this face, which can almost guarantee you that I won't get in anywhere. Because I'm, I'm like, sadly, the last person a lot of people like this um, want to see. Um, well, I've only done that to myself, so I have no one to blame. But uh, I'm just saying, we had no idea if we get in. And uh, Dan Kildee, uh, the congressman from Flint, said, sure, uh, come on. And, and we headed over there. <clears throat> we ran into a couple of Canadians on the way over, and they wanted to get a selfie. And, you know, they're Canadians, right? You, what are you going to do? you got to say yes. Right there. Yeah. And they told me that they had just left the gallery, or the House Gallery that they were there. I said, how'd you get your Canadians? How'd you get in there? Oh, we just walked in. There, it was half empty, they said. You said, you're kidding. And then I guess they ran into AOC or, or one of her staff people and she had a couple of passes or whatever and handed them to her and then they just, the Canadians went in. I thought, well, Jesus, maybe this isn't as hard uh, as it seems. And in fact, Congressman Kildee's uh, receptionist in his office there when we went there. Uh, she said some people had actually come down from Flint today hoping to get in and they just came to his office just like we did and uh, they gave him a couple of passes and they, they uh, were going to watch the debate for most of the day and then head back to Flint. I had no idea really that it was that easy or that because you would think you'd have to get down there line up at 3 in the morning stand in line for 5, 6, 7 hours Maybe you'll get in, and I'm sure that is the case at oftentimes at these hearings. But it was it was a little surprising just how people are certainly not disinterested in what's going on. They're, everyone's deeply affected by it, and 
certainly the people I know are filled with a lot of despair, but there were the there we walked in. We walked in with Congressman Kildee into the gallery of the House, and um, there were plenty of seats. And so we took our seats. We watched about four hours of debate, and, uh, and then they had the vote. It's really, it's one thing when you watch this on C-SPAN or CNN or MSNBC, and it is another thing when you're there in person. It is a very... I don't know what television does, but um, I don't know if it's the two-dimensional nature of it or just how it flattens out the whole experience. Or, you know, I don't know, whenever you're watching it on TV and whatever Congress person is at the microphone droning on and on and you're thinking, there's got to be somebody in the control booth at the network going, oh, my God, please. Can we switch, can we switch to a California wildfire or the, that bear that's trying to get into the car? or something other than this. But when you're there and in, in person, two things strike you when you look down on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. Number one, the Democrats are all a bit loosey-goosey. They're kind of relaxed. You know, they're, they're, they're wearing what they want to wear. There's women present. Uh, not a lot of them. But there's hell of a lot more than on the other side of the aisle and, and uh, so you notice things like that you notice that they're not all white this is a variety of, of Americans and Americans of different ethnicities and backgrounds and and you know you unless you are from the working class you, you it's hard to tell sometimes you know who is from the working but but if you are from the working class you you are you spot the other the people that grew up in the working class and um, and some of these democratic representatives in, in their faces uh, it's there's just I don't know what I don't know how to describe it, it, it but uh, if you grew up in it or you lived in it for a good chunk of your adult life or you're still in it um, you know sadly the you can see the tire tracks of life you can see that the that that the big semi u-haul truck of life has um, run across you a few times and occasionally just backed up and run over you again. Um, So you see that. You see that in the faces of those Democratic representatives. All kinds of people that look like they've had probably all kinds of experiences. Then you look over at the Republicans and it is it's wackadoodle time. Let me just tell you that right now. It's like First of all, they look like they've all been stamped out of some kind of uh, bot factory. They all look the same. They are of one gender. There's, there's, a, there's one or two uh, women in there, but it's all men. They're all white, mostly. One or two exceptions, you know. Uh, mistakes, you know, mistakes on the assembly line. Something happened. But generally, you've got white men who are, are on some kind of a anger tear inside of themselves and they're just they're just squirming in their chairs and there's all these fits they seem to be having and they're uh, they're looking over and they're wanting to just you know rip the throats out of the democrats and they're they're, they're just so angry that anybody would question their leader who i noticed in the last few days here leading up to the impeachment they like referring to Trump not as the president but as the commander the commander in chief you would dare to say these things about our commander and they always pause and just, just pay attention to this Watch, you'll hear this now every now and then they refer to him as the commander in chief just a little pause after the word commander for all of you handmade tale uh, followers it's really freaky I have to tell you I did you know, we all have, we all say these things about them. The crazy wrestling coach that's, you know, was on the, uh, yeah, both, I think he was on both impeachment committees. Uh, the guy from Ohio State. And then the Gomert from Texas. Oh my God. Matt Gates. Yeah, Matt Gates. I keep calling him Max for some reason. These people, oh, and, and who's the Nunez from California? Uh, you couldn't cast a better group of, really deranged unhinged men 
I mean, it's really some scary stuff. When you're in the room with them, when you see them, and you, not just when they're at the microphone. That's all you see when you're watching C-SPAN or CNN. But these guys in their chairs, they're just like, they can't sit still. They're so, every time, every time Adam Schiff says something, they, they start howling. It's this weird sound, too. It's not just like a boo. They're like, <laughs> it's like you're like in the room and you're thinking, okay, this is otherworldly. This is, <laughs> this is some kind of horror movie or something. Who are these? Are they human? Yes, and of course they are. I do not want to dehumanize them, but I just... I just want to give you the the feel of it. It's um, there was one point where it was really bright in there, and and the lights. I don't know if the lights went down or they flickered out for a second or something, but it's it creeped me out. That I thought, oh geez, don't don't. If they ever turn the lights out in here, um, with uh, with we're stuck in the dark with these with these creatures, man, not where I want to be. Anyways, they went on, on and on for six hours. The Democrats stood and they went through very carefully each of the things that Trump has done, um, how he obstructed Congress, how he abused his power, uh, trying to collaborate with the president of another country to dig up dirt on the person that he thought he was going to have to face in next year's election. You know, it got laid out uh, over and over again. Of all the Republicans who spoke in their three hours, not one of them could offer any retort to the facts that Trump had that call with the Ukrainian um, president. Literally, they didn't offer a single thing. All they could do was talk about conspiracy theories and how... I, I, I Honestly, I couldn't follow some of it because they've got something going on in their heads that, that there's some kind of weird conspiracy going on with the Democrats, which, as we all know, that's really giving the Democrats way too much credit to think that they could actually pull off some sort of, uh, you know, get together, have a strategy, and defeat the other side. That's what a conspiracy would require. But the Republicans seem to think that the devil exists on the other side of the aisle. And they're not kidding. When they talk like that, it's um, not pleasant. And uh, and a bit a bit scary. So after the six hours, it was it was time for a vote, and um, everybody came in. Then uh, the gallery filled up. I don't think I didn't see an empty seat. Uh, uh, a lot of the spouses of the members of Congress came and sat up there. We met Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's uh, boyfriend. He sat uh, in our row. There were children actually, uh, children of the. Uh, members of Congress. Uh, oh, Ilhan, Ilhan Omar's uh, 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 girls, I think, were both of them. They were up there. Um, there was a large section for walk-ins from the public uh, that were there. Uh, that looked good. That was that stayed full all day. You know, everybody got very, it got very exciting and intense as they got closer to having the vote. And then Nancy Pelosi called Call for the vote. Let me just say something to about Nancy Pelosi. First of all, we ran into her daughter uh, up in the in the gallery, uh, Alexandra uh, Pelosi, who's a documentary filmmaker. I've, I've known her for a, a number of years, and um, we had a great talk about uh, the election next year, uh, what we think is going to happen, what needs to happen, and you know, I was telling her about her her mom and just how, well, even though I, I may have had disagreements with her over the years because her politics and mine are not the same. Uh, she's managed this whole impeachment thing with amazing force and uh, willpower and brains. It's it's really been something to witness, I think. Uh, and hats off to her uh, for um, for doing this in the right way. Somebody said to me earlier today, "Yeah, but there was 30 other things we could impeach him on." I said, "Yeah, but look, what country do you think you live in? You got to be able to know the room. You got to read the room. The room is called our fellow Americans and." Most Americans, I happen to think, are actually pretty smart people, and they care a lot, and they do know what's going on. But uh, they got a lot going on in their lives. A lot of people are working two or three jobs. It, you know, they barely see the kids for a half hour by the time they get home, put the kids to bed, 
struggling to live from paycheck to paycheck. They don't. They don't have time time to follow the weeds of this po- of politics. I said to this person who said who said to me, you know, oh, there's 30 other impeachment things. That, I said you can't keep that straight. You can't, it's too much. It's too much. I, mean, uh, I said go, name for me right now the 32 uh, NFL football teams. Go ahead, name them. You like football. I know you like football. So, what are they? Name the 32 teams. He was like, well, I can name, I think I can name most of them. Yeah, exactly. My point, you know, it's, uh, we don't need 32 articles of impeachment. We, we, they're, they're, with Trump, there's probably 132 articles we could have on this guy. But what we need is to remove him from office. And I know most people are thinking, well, Mike, you know, that's not going to happen in the Senate. Well, you know, stranger things have happened. Here's what I think. You want the Senate to vote on this? Want, want to remove him in the Senate? I've been thinking this, you know, for the last few weeks. We need to slow things down a bit and get subpoenas, and we need to get that that national security server that's in the White House, where they the the server where they hid the Iranian phone call. You see, they knew that phone call was so illegal. Trump's loyal supporters put that on the secret server in the White House so nobody would find it, and then a whistleblower told us about it now we know it exists and they need to subpoena that server and they need to find out what else has been hidden on it in these three years do you think only the ukrainian phone call was put on that server i don't think so do you think that's the only time trump kind of messed up and broke the law tried to bribe somebody tried to extort somebody you think that's the only time no you don't and i don't care what your politics are whether you're democrat or republican or you don't give a shit you know that that ukrainian phone call is not the only piece of evidence. No. There's more there. And I think when the American people hear the rest of what's been hidden on that server, boom. That's it. And they're going to make the Senate. They're going to make the Senate get rid of this guy. Republicans who care about the Republican Party are going to want to get rid of him because this is the end, folks. Republicans. This is the <laughs> If you don't deal with this right now, you have no idea what's in front of you. First of all, do you, you do realize that young people want nothing to do with you. 18 to 35 year olds, it's just atrocious. Nobody, we're, we're, all, we're almost through two generations of young people having been raised and go through college and get out and get a job if they can find a job. And they are not Republicans. Are we at Philly? Are we in Philly? Oh, wow. We've gone from Wilmington to Philly just in one podcast. Well, I wanted to wrap this up by the time we got to Philly. So let me tell you what happened. He was impeached. They had two votes. There were two articles of impeachment. One was uh, abuse of Congress and one was abuse of power, obstruction of Congress and abuse of power. And uh, the House voted overwhelmingly uh, to impeach him on both counts. And... Nancy Pelosi had told the Democratic congressman to, you know, after the vote, don't have a big cheer, don't, um, you know, don't don't gloat, don't don't do a victory lap, don't do an end zone dance. By the way, the end zone dances just keep getting better and better. The choreography, these NFL games, it's incredible, and um, it would have been actually really cool to see the Minnesota delegation do one of those new modern NFL end zone choreographed dances once once impeachment was voted on article one and article two uh in fact pelosi pelosi held up her hand to like warn everybody to be dignified but we were up there right we were in the first row in the balcony there we just uh we just started cheering we were so happy and um and um we're not members of congress so we don't have to follow any rules there we there we were we got to watch this live right there in person and it was as easy as um, just getting on the train, going down to our nation's capital. There was such, a, there was a wave of emotion in that gallery. Uh, I looked around, some people were tearing up. Tearing up because nothing ever good really happens, does it? Certainly not with our political establishment. You know, it seems like the bad guys always win. The people, the everyday people, just trying to get by. Never get a good thing happen to them ever once. Never get a break. And then, boom, something like this happens tonight. And it's like, wow, yeah. Yeah, 
we could actually bring down somebody like Donald J. Trump. This guy has been bullying people since boarding school. He's been a shit to so many people through his life, and he's never been called on it, never has had to suffer as a result of it, never has had been forced to change his ways to see what life is like for people that don't walk in his shoes. He's gotten away with it so many times. He's gotten away with it in business. He's gotten away with it in, in violating all kinds of laws in New York State, New York City. Nobody ever, nobody ever stopped him. Nobody could do it. And then, boom, tonight, tonight, 229, 230 members of Congress of all sorts of Americans that they represent said, that's it, bully. Bully time is over. And it really, you felt it in the room. And then you looked over at the Republicans and they were, they were in a snarl of bitterness and anger and they wanted to start their revolution right then. And all of a sudden, this kind of howl, I mean, they've been grumbling and doing that thing all day and into the night. But when it was announced that he had been impeached and that that was that and there wasn't anything else they were going to be able to do about it, they just started this kind of, I don't know, how would you guys describe it? I was just, it was a sound, how, here's how I put it. It was a sound I'd never heard before. It, it, <laughs> I mean, I've lived a long time, it seems. I've heard all kinds of noises. I've been in all kinds of rooms. And I'd never heard this. It's, I'm, I'm totally incapable of reenacting it for you. They would not allow my podcast recorder uh, into, the, into the house gallery. Uh, they would not they took our iPhones from us so we couldn't have those in there so I have it's in my head and I don't know I don't know how to describe what it sounded like but it was it was it was unreal and I got up I stood up I don't know whether I should stay and listen to more of this or we should let's just get the hell out of here maybe this is the best way to put it the dinosaurs what was that like what was that like when they met their end when they were in their final days, they realized it was over. They knew that they weren't going to survive. These large, large creatures brought down by essentially what we believe now is a, a meteor that hit the planet Earth and caused a, a series of events that cooked large parts of the Earth and cooked the dinosaurs and made them, they couldn't move. The Earth was so, the ground was so hot and they were unable to to survive and they knew it was over and there was nothing they could do see we didn't have videotape then we didn't have film we didn't have sound recorders so we have no idea what it looked like or what it sounded like but I think what I heard tonight I think that's what it sounded like I think that they I think that there was a sense in the room amongst the Republicans that uh, that they the others them the women the people that have color on their skin young people young women young women of color are taking over. They're taking over. Uh, we're not going to be in power for much longer. They know this. They know the end for their reign is near. And this tonight was just one more example of that. It's the last call for Philadelphia. Or you know what? It's also the last call for the Republican Party. It's the last call for these angry old white guys who've been running things for way too long. The demographic already shows it. The statistics, we already know what's going to happen. Somewhere in the 2040s, white people are going to be the minority in the United States of America. That's just a fact. And they know it. They don't like a lot of facts. They know this one's true. They know that this is, this is the beginning of the end. And that was the howl we heard. The howl knowing that, that they can't really do anything about it as long as we have a democracy, as long as we have a system of one person, one vote. They're doomed. Unless they can come up with another system. Unless dear leader, the commander, doesn't leave the White House. Unless, 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 whatever it is they're concocting in their bot brains. Like anybody who's held power for any period of time, in this case it would be thousands of years, they're not going to go quietly. And they don't want to give it up. And that's, that's what we heard in person tonight in that house chamber 
and it was both frightening and also a reminder of the work that all of us have in front of us. What we need to do in the, in the coming months before next year's election, my friends, please, this is not the time to sit it out. I know you're busy and I know you're tired. I'm tired. We don't have a choice. This in, in invasion of the, of the bot snatchers is what we're witnessing. And it's time to stop arguing with them, trying to convince them, trying to do whatever it is you want to do with them. I know some of them are in your families or they're your friends or whatever, but you just got to let them be. And you've got to start talking to the women and the young people and the people of color that you know about what we're going to do in this coming year to throw, throw the bastards out. They've all got to go. There was a banner in one of the rallies last night all across the country, hundreds and hundreds of marches and rallies for impeachment. And one of the banners said, impeach them all. That is the mood of the country right now. People have had it. I remain hopeful. I remain somewhat optimistic that if we all get together, there's more of us than there are of them. And tonight was a great, great first step. Oh, my God. Those of you who are either going to sleep tonight or maybe you're listening to this in the morning, an incredible step was taken in the House chamber last night. This was incredible. Uh, let's build on it, okay? All of us. The next steps are the ones that you and I have to take. We're pulling out of Philly here on the Amtrak, Amtrak number 66, the last train of the night to New York City. And Newark and New York will be our next stops. And we'll get off the train and we'll go home and we'll think about this and we'll get up in the morning and we're all going to do what we got to do. And everybody should be celebrating this moment. Thanks for listening. I'll be back in another day or so. My first uh, two weeks of my my brand new first time ever podcast. Uh, it's a it's a <laughs> it's a weekly podcast, but um, I thought the first couple weeks here we do a bunch of them. Just get the feel of it, and and, um, and let you get the feel of it, and let you join in me, uh, and join with me and. Let me know what you think. Uh, you know, each of these platforms of the podcast, that you can write a review. You can rate it, you know, the stars, give it stars, give it give it a review. Let me know what you think. If you go on Anchor, uh, you can actually leave, leave me. I listened to them this morning. Um, I, so just know I listened to it. So if you want to go on and, and leave me a voicemail, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, we're going to have our, our Rumble website, at least our landing page up here in the next day or two. And uh, uh, you'll be able to sign up for my weekly uh, letter. But subscribe to the podcast. It's free. I'd like you to be part of this. We're all in this together. All of us. Let's never forget that. Um, I don't. I think about it every day. And I, and I really wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I was one of millions. I think was it the, the immortal words of public enemy. <laughs> it takes a nation of millions. We, we don't have to worry about that because we're the majority. And uh, we need to use our power in a good way here to remove him from the White House and to um, create a better country uh, something that we want to be proud of um, and that's what we're all about the jury's out we don't know what'll happen but um, that is no reason to sit back and do nothing so um, have a good night um, subscribe to the podcast it's Rumble with Michael Moore I'm Michael Moore and um, we're on our way into New Jersey what better way to end an evening? Thanks, everybody. We're gonna do, we're gonna do exactly the way my grandmother from Beth Hanina Palestine did it to, to all of my residents that have gone through the civil rights movement. Continue to fight for Black Lives Matter for everything. Don't you ever, ever let anybody take away your roots, your culture, who you are. Because when you do, people love you and you win. And when your son looks at you and says, Mama, look, you won, bullies don't win. And I said, Baby, they don't. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the motherfucker. Yeah!